death of an old old man oh god how i am frightened now that i'm alone i don't have to hide it i don't have to hide anything any longer i can let my face go because no one can see me because there is 21000 feet between me and them and because now that it's happening again i couldn't pretend anymore even if i wanted to now i don't have to press my teeth together and tighten the muscles of my jaw as i did during lunch when the corporal brought in the message when he handed it to the tinker and tinker looked up at me and said charlie it's your turn you are next up as if i didn't know that as if i didn't know that i was next up as if i didn't know it last night when i went to bed and at midnight when i was still awake and all the way through the night at 1 in the morning and at 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and at 7 o'clock when i got up as if i didn't know it while i was dressing and while i was having breakfast and while i was reading the magazines in the mess playing shove half penny in the mess reading the notices in the mess playing billiards in the mess i knew it then and i knew it when we went into lunch while we were eating that mutton for lunch and when the corporal came into the room with a message it wasn't anything at all it wasn't anything more than when it begins to rain because there's a black cloud in the sky when he handed the paper to tinker i knew what tinker was going to say before he had opened his mouth i knew exactly what he was going to say so that wasn't anything either but when he folded the message up and put it in his pocket and said finish your pudding you've got plenty of time that was when it got worse because i knew for certain that that it was going to happen again that within half an hour i would be strapping myself in and testing the engine and signaling to the airmen to pull away the chokes the others were all sitting around eating their pudding mine was still on my plate in front of me and i couldn't take another mouthful but it was fine when i tightened my jaw muscles and said thank god for that i'm tired of sitting around here picking my nose it was certainly fine when i said that it must have sounded like any of the others just before they started off and when i got up to leave the table and said see with the time that must have sounded all the right too but now i don't have to do any of that thank christ i don't have to do that now i can just loosen up and let myself go i can do or say anything i want so long as i fly this aeroplane properly it didn't used to be like this 4 years ago it was wonderful I loved doing it because it was exciting because the waiting on the aerodrome was nothing more than the waiting before a football game or before going in to bat and 3 years ago it was all right too but then always a 3 months of resting and the going back again and the resting and the going back always going back and always getting away with it everyone saying what a fine pilot no one knowing what a near thing it was that time near brussels and how lucky it was that time over dipe and how bad it was that other time over dipe and how lucky and bad and scared i have been every minute of every trip every week this year no one knows that they all say charlie is a great pilot charlie is a born flyer charlie is terrific I think he was once but not any longer. Each time now it gets worse. At first it begins to grow upon you slowly. Coming upon you slowly, creeping up on you from behind, making no noise, 
so that you do not turn around and see it coming. If you saw it coming, perhaps you could stop it. But there is no warning. It creeps closer and closer like a cat creeps closer stalking a sparrow. And then when it is right behind you, it does not spring like the cat would spring. It just leans forward and whispers in your ear. It touches you gently on the shoulder and whispers to you that you are young. That you have a million things to do and a million things to say. That if you are not careful, you will buy it. That you are almost certain to buy it sooner or later. And that when you do, you will not be anything any longer. You will just be a charred corpse. It whispers to you about how your corpse will look when it is charred. How black it will be and how it will be twisted and brittle with the face black and the fingers black and the shoes off the feet because the shoes always come off the feet when you die like that. At first, it whispers to you only at night. When you are lying awake in bed at night, then it whispers to you at odd moments during the day when you are doing your teeth or drinking a beer or when you are walking down the passage and in the end it becomes so that you hear it all day and all night all the time there is ichmudin just the same as ever with the little knob sticking out just beside it there are the frisians texels wyland terschelling amland joist and nordne i know them all they look like bacteria under a microscope, there's a Judal Sea, there's Holland, there's the North Sea, there's Belgium, and there's the world. There's a whole bloody world right there, with all the people who aren't going to get killed, and all the houses, and the towns, and the sea, with all the fish. The fish aren't going to get killed either. I'm the only one that's going to get killed. I don't want to die. Oh God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die today anyway and uh, it is in the pain really it is in the pain I don't mind having my leg mashed or my arm burnt off I swear to you that I don't mind that but I don't want to die four years ago I didn't mind I remember distinctly not minding about it four years ago I didn't mind about it three years ago either it was all fine and exciting is it always is when it looks as though you may be going to lose as it did then it is always fine to fight when you are going to lose everything anyway and that was how it was four years ago but now we're going to win it is so different when you're going to win if i die now i lose 50 years of life and i don't want to lose that I lose anything except that because that would be all the things I want to do and all the things I want to see, all the things like going on sleeping with joy, like going home sometimes, like walking through a wood, like pouring out a drink from a bottle, like looking forward to weekends and like being alive every hour, every day, every year for 50 years. If I die now, I will miss all that. And I will miss everything else. I will miss the things that I don't know about. I think those are really the things I'm frightened of missing. I think the reason I don't want to die is because of the things I hope will happen. Yes, that's right. I'm sure that's right. Point a revolver at a tram, at a wet shivering tram on the side of the road and say, I'm going to shoot you and he will cry. Don't shoot, please don't shoot. The tram clings to life because of the things he hopes will happen. I'm clinging to it for the same reason, but I have clung for so long now that I cannot hold on much longer. Soon I will have to let go. It is like hanging over the edge of a cliff. That's what it is like. And I have been hanging on too long now. Holding on to the top of the cliff with my fingers, not being able to pull myself back up, with my fingers getting more and more tired, beginning to hurt and to ache, so that I know that sooner or later I will have to let go. 
I dare not cry out for help. That is one thing that I dare not do. So I go on hanging over the side of this cliff. And as I hang, I keep kicking a little with my feet against the side of the cliff, trying desperately to find a foothold. But it is steep and smooth like the side of a ship. And there isn't any foothold. I'm kicking now. That's what I'm doing. I'm kicking against the smooth side of the cliff and there isn't any foothold. Soon I shall have to let go. The longer I hang on the more certain, I'm of that. And so each hour, each day, each night, each week, I become more and more frightened. Four years ago, I wasn't hanging over the edge like this. I was running about in the field above. And although I knew that there was a cliff somewhere and that I might fall over it, I did not mind. Three years ago, it was the same, but now it is different. I know that I'm not a coward. I'm certain of that. I will always keep going. Here I am today, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, sitting here flying a course of 135 at 360 miles an hour and flying well. And although I'm so frightened that I can hardly think, yet I'm going on to do this thing. There was never any question of not going or of turning back. I would rather die than turn back. Turning back never enters into it. It would be easier if it did. I would prefer to have to fight that than to have to fight this fear. This wasn't little camouflage groups of buildings and great big camouflage aerodrome probably full of 109s and 1090s. Holland looks wonderful. It must be a lovely place in the summer. I expect they are him making down there now. I expect the German soldiers are watching the Dutch girls hair making bastards. Watching them hair making then making them come home with them afterwards. I would like to be hair making now. I would like to be haymaking and drinking cedar. The pilot was sitting upright in the cockpit. His face was nearly hidden by his goggles and by his oxygen mask. His right hand was resting lightly upon the stick and his left hand was forward on the throttle. All the time he was looking around him into the sky. From force of habit his head never ceased to move from one side to the other. Slowly, mechanically, like clockwork, so that each moment, almost, he searched every part of the blue sky, above, below, and all around. But it was into the light of the sun itself that he looked twice, as long as he looked anywhere else. For that is the place where the enemy hides and waits before he jumps upon you. There are only two places in which you can hide yourself when you are up in the sky. One is in cloud and the other is in the light of the sun. He flew on and although his mind was walking upon many things and although his brain was the brain of a frightened man, yet his instinct was the instinct of a pilot who is in the sky of the end. With a quick glance without stopping the movement of his head, he looked down and checked his instruments. The glance took no more than a second and like a camera can record a dozen things at once with the openings of a shutter. So he, at a glance, recorded with his eyes his oil pressure, his petrol, his oxygen, his rev counter, boost and his air speed. And in the same instant, almost he was looking up again into the sky. He looked at the sun and as he looked, as he screwed up his eyes and searched into the dazzling brightness of the sun, he thought that he saw something. Yes. There it was, a small black speck moving slowly across the bright surface of the sun. And to him, the speck was not a speck but a life-size German pilot sitting in a folk wolf which had cannon in its wings. He knew that he had been seen. He was certain that the one above was watching him, taking his time, sure of being hidden in the brightness of the sun, watching this spitfire and waiting to pounce. The man in the spitfire did not take his eye away from the small speck of black. His head was quite still now. He was watching the enemy and as he watched, 
His left hand came away from the throttle and began to move delicately around the cockpit. It moved quickly and surely, touching this thing and that, switching on his reflector sight, turning his trigger button from safe over to fire and pressing gently with his thumb upon a lever which increased ever so slightly the pitch of the air screw. There was no thought in his head now, save for the thought of battle. He was no longer frightened or thinking of being frightened. All that was a dream and as a sleeper who opens his eyes in the morning and forgets his dream. So this man had seen the enemy and had forgotten that he was frightened. It was always the same. It had happened a hundred times before and now it was happening again. Suddenly, in an instant, he had become cool and precise and as he prepared himself, as he made ready his cockpit, he watched the German, waiting to see what he would do. This man was a great pilot. He was great because when the time came, whenever the moment arrived, his coolness was great and his courage was great. And more than anything else, his instinct was great. Greater by far than his coolness or his courage or his experience, now he eased upon the throttle and pulled the stick gently backwards. Trying to gain height, trying to gain a little of a 5000 feet advantage which the German had over him. But there was not much time. The folk wolf came out of the sun with its nose down and it came fast. The pilot saw it coming and it, he kept going straight on. Pretending that he had not seen it and all the time he was looking over his shoulder, watching the German waiting for the moment to turn. If he turned too soon, the German would turn with him and he would be duck soup. If he turned too late, the German would get him anyway provided that he could shoot straight and he would be duck soup then too. So he watched and waited, turning his head and looking over his shoulder, judging his distance and as the German came within range. As he was about to press his thumb upon the trigger button, the pilot swerved. He yonked the stick hard back and over to the left. He kicked hard with his left foot upon the rudder bar and like a leaf which is caught up and carried away by a gust of wind. The Spitfire flipped over onto its side and changed direction. The pilot blacked out. As his sight came back, as the blood drained away from his head and from his eyes, he looked up and saw the German fighter way ahead, turning with him, banking hard, trying to turn tighter and tighter in order to get back on the tail of the Spitfire. The fight was on. Here we go, he said to himself. Here we go again and he smiled again. Smile once. Quickly because he was confident and because he had done this so many times before, and because each time he had won. The man was a beautiful pilot. But the German was good too. And when the Spitfire plied a little flap in order to turn in tighter circles, the folk wolf appeared to do the same. And they turned together. When the Spitfire throttled back suddenly and got on his tail, the folk wolf half rolled and dived out and under and was away. Pulling up again in a loop, and rolling off the top so that he came in again from behind. The Spitfire half rolled and dived away but the folk wolf anticipated him and half rolled and dived with him. Behind him on his tail and here he took a quick shot at the Spitfire. But he missed. For at least 15 minutes the two small aircraft rolled and dived around each other in the sky. Sometimes they would separate, wheeling around and around in tight turns, watching one another, circling and watching like two boxers circling each other in the ring, waiting for an opening or for the dropping of a guard. Then there would be a stall turn and one would attack the other. And the diving and the rolling and the zooming would start all over again. All the time the pilot of the Spitfire sat upright in his cockpit and he flew his aircraft not with his hands but with the tips of his fingers. And the Spitfire was not a Spitfire but a part of his own body. The muscles of his arms and legs were in the wings and in the tail of the machine so that when he banked and turned and dived 
and climbed. He was not moving his hands and his legs, but only the wings and the tail and the body of the aeroplane. For the body of the Spitfire was the body of the pilot and there was no difference between the one and the other. So it went on and all the while as they fought and as they flew, they lost height coming down nearer and nearer to the fields of Holland. So that soon they were fighting only 3000 feet above the ground and once one could see the hedges and the small trees and shadows which the small trees made upon the grass. Once the German tried a long shot from a thousand yards and the pilot of the Spitfire saw the tracer streaming pass in front of the nose of his machine. Once when they flew close past each other, he saw for a moment the head and shoulders of the German under the grass roof of his cockpit. The head turned towards him with the brown helmet, the goggles, the nose and the white scarf. Once when, the, when he blacked out from a quick pull out, the blackout lasted longer than usual. It lasted maybe 5 seconds and when his sight came back, he looked quickly around for the four wolves and saw it half a mile away, flying straight at him on the beam. A thin inch long black line which grew quickly so that almost at once it was no longer an inch, but an inch and a half then two inches, then six and then a foot. There was hardly any time. There was a second or perhaps two at the most, but it was enough because he did not have to think or to wonder what to do. He had only to allow his instinct to control his arms and his legs and the wings and the body of the aeroplane. There was only one thing to do and the Spitfire did it. It banged steeply and turned at right angles towards the fourth wolf facing it and flying straight towards it for a head-on attack. The two machines flipped fast towards each other. The pilot of the Spitfire sat upright in his cockpit and now, more than ever, the aircraft was a part of his body. His eyes were, eye was upon the reflector side, the small yellow electric light dot which was projected up in the front of the windshield and it was upon the thinness of the fork wolf beyond. Quickly, precisely, he moved his aircraft a little this way and that, and the yellow dot, which moved with the aircraft, danced and jerked this way and that. And then suddenly, it was upon the thin line of the fork wolf, and there it stayed. His right thumb in the leather glove felt for the firing button. He squeezed it gently, as a rifleman squeezes a trigger, his guns fired and at the same time he saw the small spurts of flame from the cannon in the nose of the fork wolf. The whole thing from beginning to end took perhaps as long as it would take you to light a cigarette. The German pilot came straight on at him and he had a sudden vivid colorless view of the round nose and the thin outstretched wings of the fork wolf. Then there was a crack as their wing tips met and there was a splintering as the port wings of the Spitfire came away from the body of the machine. The Spitfire was dead. It fell like a dead bird falls, fluttering a little as it died, continuing in the direction of its flight as it fell. The hands of the pilot, almost in a single moment, undid his strips, tore off his helmet and slid back the hood of the cockpit. Then they grasped the edges of the cockpit and he was out and away, falling, reaching for the ripcord, grasping it with his right hand, pulling on it so that his parachute billowed out and opened and the straps jerked him hard with the fork of his legs. All of a sudden, the silence was great. The wind was blowing on his face and in, and in his hair, hair and he reached up a hand and brushed the hair away from his eyes. He was about a thousand feet up and he looked down and saw a flat green country with fields and hedges and no trees. He could see some cows in the field below him. Then he looked up and as he looked, he said, Good God! And his right hand moved quickly to his right hip, feeling for his revolver which he had not brought with him. For there, not more than 500 yards away, 
parachuting down at the same time and at the same height was another man and he knew when he saw him that it could be only the german pilot obviously his plane had been damaged at the same time as the spitfire in the collision he must have got out quickly too and now here they were both of them parachuting down so close to each other that they might even land in the same field he looked again at the german hanging there in his straps with his legs apart his hands above his head grasping the cords of the parachute he seemed to be a small man thickly built and by no means young the german was looking at him too he kept looking and when his body swung around the other way he turned his head looking over his shoulder so they went on down both men were watching each other thinking about what would happen soon and the german was the king because he was landing in his own territory the pilot of the spitfire was coming down in enemy country he would be taken prisoner or he would be killed or he would kill a german and if he did that he would escape i'll escape anyway he thought i'm sure i can run faster than the german he doesn't look as though he could run very fast i will race him across the fields and get away the ground was closed now uh, there were no many seconds to go he saw that the german would almost certainly land in the same field as he the field with the cows he looked down to see what the field was like and whether the hedges were thick and whether there was a gate in the hedge and as he looked he saw below him in the field a small pond and there was a small stream running through the pond it was a cow drinking pond muddy around the edges and muddy in the water the pond was right below him he was no more than the height of a horse above it and he was dropping fast he was dropping right into the middle of the pond quickly he grasped the cords above his head and tried to spill the parachute to one side so that he would change direction but he was too late it wasn't any good all at once something brushed the surface of his brain and the top of his stomach and the fear which he had forgotten in the fighting was upon him again he saw the pond and the black surface of the water of the pond and the pond was not a pond and the water was not water it was a small black hole in the surface of earth which went on down and down for miles and miles with steep smooth sides like the sides of a ship and it was so deep that when you fell into it you went on falling and falling and you fell forever he saw the mouth of the hole and the deepness of it and he was only a small brown pebble which someone had picked up and thrown into the air so that it would fall into the hole he was a pebble which someone uh, had picked up in the grass of the field that was all he was and now he was falling and the hole was below him splash he hit the water he went through the water and his feet hit the bottom of the pond they sank into the mud on the bottom of his half head went under the water but it came up again and he was standing with the water up to his shoulders the parachute was on top of him his head was tangled in a mass of cords and white silk and he pulled at them with his hands first this way and then that but it only got worse and the fear got worse because the white silk was covering his head so that he could see nothing but a mass of white clothes and a tangle of cords then he tried to move towards the bank but his feet were stuck in the mud he had sunk up to his knees in the mud so he fought the parachute and the tangled cords of the parachute pulling at them with his hands and trying to get them clear of his head and as he did so he heard the sound of uh, footsteps running on the grass he heard the noise of the footsteps coming closer and the german must have jumped because there was a splash and he was knocked over by the weight of a man's body he was the uh, he was under the water and instinctively he began to struggle but his feet were still stuck in the mud the man was on top of him and there were hands around his neck holding him under the squeezing his neck with strong fingers he opened his eyes and saw brown water he noticed the bubbles in the water small bright bubbles rising slowly upward in the brown water there was no noise or shouting or anything else but only the bright bubbles moving upward 
in the water and suddenly as he watched them his mind became clear and calm like a sunny day i want struggle he thought there's no point in struggling for when there's a black cloud in the sky it is bound to rain he relaxed his body and all the muscles in his body because he had no further wish to struggle how nice it is not to struggle he thought there's no point in struggling i was a fool to have struggled so much and for so long i was a fool to have prayed for the sun when there was a black cloud in the sky i should have prayed for rain i should have shouted for rain i should have shouted let it rain let it rain in solid sheets and i will not care then it would have been easy it would have been so easy then i have struggled for 5 years and now i don't have to do it anymore this is so much better this is ever so much better because there is a wood somewhere that i wish to walk through and you cannot walk struggling through a wood there is a girl somewhere that i wish to sleep with and you cannot sleep struggling with a girl you cannot do anything struggling especially you cannot live struggling and so now i'm going to do all the things that i want to do and there will be no more struggling see how calm and lovely it is like this see how sunny it is and what a beautiful feel this is ah with the cows and the little pond and the green hedges with prime roses growing in the hedges nothing will worry me any more now nothing 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 not even that man splashing in the water of the pond over there he seems very puffed and out of breath he seems to be dragging something out of the pond something heavy now he's got to it the side and he's pulling it up on the grass how funny it's a body it's a body of a man as a matter of fact i think it's me yes it's me i know it is because of that smudge of yellow paint on the front of my flying suit now he is kneeling down searching in my pockets taking out my money and my identification card he's found my pipe and the letter i got this morning from my mother he's taking off my watch now he's getting up he's going away he's going to leave my body behind lying on the grass beside the pond he's walking quickly away across the field towards the gate how wet and excited he looks he ought to relax a bit he ought to relax like me he can't be enjoying himself that way i think i will tell him why don't you relax a bit goodness how he jumped when i spoke to him and his face just look at his face i have never seen a man look at look as frightened as that he's daring to run he's starting to run he keeps looking back over his shoulder but he keeps on running but just look at his face just look how unhappy and frightened he is i don't want to go with him i think i'll leave him i think i'll stay here for a bit i think i'll go along the hedges and find some prime roses and if i'm lucky i may find some white violets then i will go to sleep i will go to sleep in the sun thank you for attending this session do share and subscribe to this channel for more lessons like this check out other video lessons by clicking on the video